So just for everyone on the call, I think the way that we're going to kind of run this panel tonight is our first time doing a subspecialty panel like this via Zoom. Um, so we're just going to have all of the panelists introduce themselves briefly, and then I'll run through a few questions that we got from students as well as from the orthopedic surgery student interest group and the sports medicine student interest group. And then we'll open it up uh, to questions, but we'd like this to be as much of a conversation as possible. So if any of the students have a question, like please feel free to raise your hand or just to interrupt during the conversation. Um, so I'll first just have all of our panelists kind of quickly introduce themselves. Dr. Petrosini, you're on my top uh, left of my screen, so I'll have you start. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Anthony Petrosini. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. And I specialize in sports medicine. Uh, I practice in the Monmouth Ocean County area. I think uh, a couple of my colleagues, all of us are, on, are from the same group in uh, Orthopedic Institute, Briel Orthopedics. Um, started in, gosh, 1997. I've been with the same group since that time. Um, did my uh, medical school at Downstead Medical Center as part of a seven-year program. Did my residency at NYU uh, Medical Center and my fellowship at uh, Mass General for Sports Medicine. Um, I don't think that covers it. Yeah. And Dr. Stamos, do you want to go next? Sure. So my name is Bruce Stamos. Uh, I'm similar to Dr. Petrosini. I'm a sports-trained orthopedic surgeon. Uh, did my medical school at Drexel, and my which was Hahnemann at the time, and then my residency at Robert Wood, and then I did the same fellowship as Dr. Petrosini at Harvard at Mass General. So, um, and then I grew up down the shore, so I've been back practicing Monmouth Ocean County for 20 years now. Dr. Navi, I see you next. So good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Navia. I am primary care sports medicine. I am family medicine originally with the subspecialty. Uh, I grew up in New Jersey. I actually went to Robert Johnson Medical School. I graduated in two, 2017. Um, did my residency at Shrehek slash Duke, North Carolina, and then came back here to Rutgers for my fellowship. Um, so I'm more of a recent attending. <laughs> Um, I am one of the RU team physicians, which is one of my, my favorite parts of my job. Um, but I think later on, you, you'll hear all the hats that I, I end up wearing during the week. Um, and I think that pretty much covers me for right now. <laughs> and I see Dr. Glasser next. Yes. Hi, I'm Lori Glasser. I have been with Orthopedic Institute, now merged Orthopedic Institute, Brielle Orthopedics now since 1996. I grew up all over the place. I was born in Hawaii, but um, went to college and medical school and part of my residency at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. And then my specialty training at Kessler, Rutgers. Now it's called Rutgers, it was UMD and J then. They, they keep changing names. Um, and so I did physical medicine and rehabilitation and sports medicine. So I'm physiatry sports medicine instead of primary care for sports medicine. Um, I think that that's what you wanted, right? Yeah. And then Leon, I see you next. Hi. Hey guys. So I'm Leon Gaunte. I'm the physical therapist, um, graduate of Nova Southeastern in 2000. Um, I've been with Orthopedic Institute of Braille Orthopedics since 2005. My specialty has been orthopedics and sports medicine, worked through different realms with the PGA, AVP volleyball, um, but just as much fun work with the average person. Awesome. Thanks so much for the introductions. Um, so from now on, you guys can just talk whenever uh, you feel like you want to answer the questions. So I think the first question we kind of had for everyone was, how did you decide that sports medicine or a career in sports medicine was something for you? Was there any formative experiences throughout your training that kind of pushed you in that direction? I keep the same order I, I can start and um you know I think I, I developed um as I started thinking about medicine I kind of uh, like a lot of people in sports medicine liked orthopedics due to background playing sports in high school and um you know seeing injuries and and eventually eventually having surgery on my own ACL which uh you know got me even further interested in sports medicine and really ended up getting to know my surgeon well and that's probably how I ended up um in the, in the sports medicine field, yeah. 
Yeah, I think we all have a, a background in sports. I, I came, my, my father was originally a gym teacher and coach and then started a construction company the year I was born. So I grew up working construction. So to me, orthopedics and sports was like a very hands-on field where you can actually fix things and not just, you know, give people medicine. So that's kind of how I stumbled into orthopedics. And then I was really debating hand and sports through through my residency and just finally decided on sports just because, uh, you know, I, I, you know, we take care of a lot of high schools and, it, you know, I'd say that's probably one of the more rewarding things is, is kind of watching kids develop and play sports and follow them through their whole career. So it's, you know, I think that's what really drew me to sports. Yeah, I think I, I will reiterate um, what's been said so far. And additionally, I, I agree. I do enjoy working the population in general. The population does want to get better. Um, you can bring some very quick relief as well and make people better and function and, and get to the goals that they want to achieve. Uh, for me particularly, I was in, very much interested in ultrasound and what we could do with ultrasound. I actually wasn't really exposed to sports medicine until about my like second year of residency. Um, because I did not have the pleasure of rotating within our department. So I know RWJ has a family medicine program that has a sports medicine track. So I actually ended up not knowing about that until about boot camp. Um, and then I down in North Carolina, um, sports medicine had a little bit of a bigger role or exposure to than I did up here in New Jersey. And so that kind of was what intrigued or piqued my interest. And it was really that ultrasound, the population, and it is very rewarding. It's my turn. Okay, so I liked everything. And I did, I def, I was a dancer, just like everyone is kind of um, interested in sports because of sports, but that wasn't my first choice. I kind I just, every, every rotation I did, I kind of thought that that's what I would do. But then ultimately I decided that this was my passion. And I just think that it was important to keep an open mind. And even the people who think that they want to do sports, maybe there's something else that's going to be their passion. So just kind of use your time in school to really explore everything. Um, for me as a physical therapist, I played 30 years of soccer and just through injuries and being exposed to physical therapy was one of the ways that, you know, made me go in that direction. Um, wasn't sure in college, um, uh, but through, you know, having a couple different injuries, it just made it a, you know, a more clear path and it's been rewarding since. Awesome. Thanks everyone for sharing. Um, I think the next question we kind of had was around what your weekly schedule looks like. I know we have some operative and non-operative providers as well as physical therapists. So I'd love to kind of hear like what the typical week looks like for everyone. So, you know, I'd say it's, it's, for me, it's evolved when I first started practice. Uh, and I think most orthopedic surgeons, whatever specialty you really start um, with a lot of uh, ER involvement, you take a lot of trauma call, ER call for fractures because it helps build your reputation in the community. You get to meet a lot of people in the hospital. And so I say the first five to eight, 10 years, that was, a good portion of my practice as, as well as the clinic in the office. And then as your practice matures, sometimes you have just kind of a natural progression that younger partners come in and they start taking more call. And the, as you get more senior, you start to take less. So now it's, it's mostly um, clinic and, and OR really not in the hospital uh, much at all. And then on the uh, you know football season is probably the busiest where you're doing things uh, on the weekends and covering games Fridays and Saturdays. And even I try to get to some basketball and lacrosse games off, off football season. So um, so you get involved with a lot of the um, the high school athletes. Um, the, I wouldn't say it's a completely nine to five job. There's certainly times where you're working later or earlier, but uh, you know the the schedule is pretty controllable as you, as you get more as you get further into practice and um, nature of sports medicine, we do a lot in surgery centers. So uh, it's funny when I started surgery centers were barely a, a thing. And uh, now almost all sports medicine is done as patient because of the improvement in anesthesia techniques and improvement of the procedures. Um, my ACL that I had done in the early nineties, a lot different than what I do now. And I, I was in the hospital for two days after it uh, back then. And now people go home right away. So um, so yeah, it's really become an outpatient type uh, practice with sports medicine. 
I would say I have a pretty similar schedule to Dr. Prestini, uh, you know, we're only a few years apart from our training, you know, a few days in the office and a couple of days in the, in the surgery center. I still do a fair amount of uh, shoulder arthroplasty. So I do a lot of those in the hospital. So I will be in the hospital a couple days a month, but for the most part, I operate at a surgery center. You know, I, th I think the thing about sports and, and this is a blessing and a curse is that you're, you kind of constantly have to be available, you know, uh, especially with taking care of multiple high schools and athletes at all levels. You know, you, you take care of a kid that goes back to college and, you know, you need to do a telehealth visit in the evening or whenever they're available. So, and dealing with athletic trainers, you know, there's always some urg urgency to most of the injuries. So, you know, you do get a fair amount of cell phone calls and, you know, that's the good thing about cell phones is you, it's, it's easier to always be available. But, you know, there's there's constant calls with, you know, so-and-so got hurt or so-and-so is trying to go back. And, you know, I think that's what makes our specialty unique is that we, we're the ones that know how to get people back on the field. And, and that e even our partners that do other specialties, they don't necessarily understand that. Someone has a hand injury and Dr. Cod operates on them, but actually getting them back playing, that's something that we still have to kind of step in and help manage. So it, it is unique, but you have to be available a lot of the time. Um, my schedule is a bit more hectic and I actually have like four different offices that I go through during the week. Um, I'll just kind of take you quickly so you guys have an idea. So I do have two half day sessions of sports medicine outpatient, meaning not associated with Rutgers, where it's located in New Brunswick. So I take care of everyone from five years old and up um, for sports related injuries. My Tuesdays and Friday mornings are my family medicine sessions where I just do regular primary care. My Tuesday afternoons is dedicated time to my high school or actually more so school district because I take care of the high school and the middle school. So I take care of South Brunswick uh, High School and the Monmouth County Middle Schools. And so I have a training room session where I go to the high school and whoever needs me or needs to be seen or needs paperwork filled out for clearance back into sport, I kind of handle all of that. My Wednesdays and Thursday mornings, I'm at the Moranhan Athletic Center in Livingston, New Jersey, which functions a bit more as a private practice. Um, I have more access to modalities in that office because of the way that it functions. So that's where I get to do like the really cool procedures like the Iovera, which is like crown neurolysis of the sensory nerves to the knee. I get to do PRP hydrodissections, um, which is kind of breaking up some scar tissue around nerves. Um, I also get to do Clark's flow, which is like the amniotic tissue, the shock wave, which is acoustic ultrasound in order to regenerate tendons and muscle. And I'm also part of a concussion clinic there where we see kids as young as five. Um, I think my oldest has been like 96 years old in that concussion clinic. So um, I have a little bit more access to modalities there. And then Thursdays afternoons, I have my uh, athletic uh, performance center day, which is where I get to be with the RU athletes. And I absolutely love Love doing that. Um, and on weekends, yes, we will have some game coverage that we have to be at. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I am 100% outpatient at um, my job every day, but it is uh, varied. And I do within the job, I don't have dedicated days per se that are just this or that, but I also do uh, a type of radial shock wave um, in my practice too, uh, but ours is a pressure wave, not ultrasound, a little bit different and do PRP. Um, I see, I specialize in dance and gymnastics. So I'm also dealing with fielding phone calls and emails, et cetera, from uh, various uh, dance places, as well as um, I'm the team doctor for a gymnastics gym that's close to me and some other gyms. Um, there, people will call me. So I just have, you know, I just get emails and I just come in early or stay late for those athletes, but it's not a specific day. So yeah, I would say it's not, you know, I, I'm not on call per se, but then you wind up doing all those things. That Very similar, but different. Oh, and also because I'm a, I, ha I maintain four board certifications, um, I also am board certified in electromyography, so I also do EMGs, um, which is a nerve or a muscle test to kind of do that. And I love all that ultrasound, which is one of the boards that I maintain. Um, you talked about it a little bit, which it's just so amazing to be able to do the high, different hydrodissections, nerve blocks, and really can see and help people in a way that um, is just right there in the office. The patients love it. They love looking at 
it, I, and for people who maybe want to do procedures, but maybe aren't necessarily wanting to be a surgeon, it allows you to get your fix of doing like a mini surgery kind of, I mean, con consider piercing the skin. So it's really fun. And in shorter time, mm -hmm. I'm standing in the OR for a bit. So <laughs> part of my yeah, you could, and the patients can actually watch when they're doing it. And then most of them get into it. You know, I had this vision of having like TV screens on every wall so they could really see, but they can't always see depending on the angle, but it is really, really cool. So for me as a physical therapist, I have uh, two roles. Primary, I'm a mm -hmm. clinician first, and the second, I run uh, P performance, all of our for, for facilities. So majority of the time I'm treating Monday through Friday, um, part of outpatient physical therapists, and this is where most getting into my field, there are nights and we have to be there for our patients, athletes. Um, this is just something you need to be there. It's not a, you know, eight to five job like sometimes in a hospital or eight to four job, um, you have to be committed to offering that type of lifestyle. Um, very rewarding. I mean, it's great working with that population. On the administrative side uh, with four facilities, um, constantly checking in on sites, site visitation, uh, doing the hiring, managing staff, uh, payroll, those type of things. So it's a pretty busy week. Um, but when it comes down to it, the best part of my job is the treating patients, um, which is obviously the most rewarding thing and the reason why we get into this uh, position. Then I think the next question we have, some people talk on this a little bit, but uh, just curious to know what your most common procedures are um, throughout your practices. Um, for, for me, I would say that 90% uh, of my Surgeries are near shoulder arthroscopies. Um, our shoulders tend to be labrum tears, repairing labrums, rotator cuffs. Knees tend to be ACLs, meniscus surgery, cartilage surgery. Um, so you know, we tendon injuries. It's funny we we have a practice that has subspecialties for everything. So again, what's evolved is uh, when I started out, I did a lot of Achilles tendon ruptures, and uh, now we have an ankle specialist. So we kind of have them do those procedures we do some elbow procedures still as well but um it's it's you know it's a 90 percent orthoscopic at, at this point yeah pretty similar to dr petrosini i do you know a lot of arthroscopic knee and shoulder fair amount of acls for sure i mean which is the most common famous sports injury so that is that is a big part of it um a lot of arthroscopic shoulder i still like i said i do do total shoulder arthroplasty and it's it's interesting, knee and hip always tends to fall into um, total joint specialists, but a lot of sports medicine special specialists end up doing total shoulders just because, you know, the shoulder's a little more specialized and really uh, we didn't know that much about the shoulder until we started doing arthroscopy. So for those of us who grew up in the era of learning arthroscopy, we kind of were doing most of the shoulder stuff. So it kind of was something I fell into when I was a fellow. There was there was a guy at Mass General who did a lot of shoulder replacements. So ended up spending some extra time with him, and you know had made it part of my practice. Uh, but you know the interesting thing about sports, and we have non-operative specialists, but a lot of what I do is non non-operative. You know, for every surgery that we do, we probably see ten to fifteen patients in the office that have uh, you know many things that are non-operative. Um, I would say our most common procedure is going to be steroid injections, you know, shoulder, hips, knees, wrists, um, most sometimes ultrasound guide is sometimes not. Um, hydrodissections are something that have become more common, um, especially as we've been getting better with ultrasounding and really finding nerves. Um, I do quite a few actually piriformis syndrome injections recently, and those are very satisfying because people feel so much better after, after receiving that. I actually remember doing like my first one in 2021 and I like have not seen the lady come back for piriformis pain. She's come back for other things like knee arthritis, but, um, she has not had her piriformis syndrome pain since that procedure. So it, it, it's very satisfying to be able to help people out with that. Um, and we do PRPs all the time, you know, hamstrings especially are the most common that we do, but um, we have 
given it in other joints as well. Uh, Shockwave has surprisingly been becoming much more popular and it's now for us more so of the go-to modality for Achilles tendonitis um, and tendinopathy instead of PRP. And so Shockwave has slowly been moving up in terms of the procedures that we do. So I pretty much see everything. And um, I, I like Dr. Petrosini was saying that it's evolved as the practice has changed because I've been there so long. Um, right now, I think I get all the joint, in, every joint I inject, sometimes with ultrasound, sometimes not depending. Um, the, something that's been referred to me a lot just this year because we have more joint replacement doctors is sometimes um, post-joint replacement, there's a stiffness called arthrofibrosis that people get. And I do a hydrodissection in between the peritoneum of the patellar tendon and Hoffa's fat pad. And it uh, uh, for people who have that, it's like almost like they overheal or there's just scar tissue and they just oftentimes will be able to have a lot more mobility. So I've just been doing more of those for whatever reason recently. Um, a big thing that comes to me is my entire body hurts. That's That's an easy visit. You know, that happens a lot. I don't know. I, I just get everything, all ages. So it's nice. But my favorite are the dancers and the gymnasts. I just, I love female athletics and um, just helping those women advocate for themselves. I feel like that's like my calling in life to help them learn their how to protect their body to not be injured. So from the physical the part, <clears throat> go ahead, do you... No, I just, I was just... <laughs> Because I see everything, Leon, I'm like, what do I see? I mean, it's like a blur. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> From the uh, physical therapy standpoint, obviously it's uh, like different types of procedures we're doing. Um, the one unique thing is while a lot of the physicians have you know, certain specialties and some are more diverse like Dr. Glasser, um, we have to see pretty much everything under the spine orthopedically, which could be from spine, joint, hand, foot and ankle. So a little bit of a jack of all trades, which is um, a little bit different in our facility and I've advocated sometimes a little more specialization in the orthopedic side from PTs. Um, some clinics will do it. Some most will just because it's busy. You have to see everything. But within that procedure wise, uh, just recently, we've been doing dry needling, um, which is, you know, subspecialty requires a different type of um, training that's required in New Jersey. We've got away from ultrasound and STEM. Those things have gone in the layer of evidences out there. They're just not as used in our clinical practice guidelines. Um, everything is evidence-based in more the physical therapy world. So those are on a lower level of um, things that require that show that help patients, um, not obviously the diagnostic ultrasound, which is totally different, but more the therapeutic. Um, so wide variety, KT taping, mobilizations, manipulations of the spine. There's quite a few different things that we're doing on a daily basis to help each individual patient. I wanted to, um, that reminded me of one other thing that I do all the time that is extremely helpful. And that is, you talked about your dry needling, but I actually inject either lidocaine or lidocaine sometimes with steroid. And that has been, it's been extremely effective. And the thought when you do the lidocaine is that it blocks kind of the central feedback back to the brain. And even though the lidocaine is short acting, the actual needling itself plus the lidocaine can be effective. And everyone argues about, is it just the needle? Is it the needle with steroid? Is it the needle with the lidocaine? You know, what is it? But people get tremendous benefit for something so simple. And I do, I do that every day. It's another thing I couldn't think of. For yes. spasms, yes, spasms, yeah, spasms, yeah. Especially the, like the neck trigger point, yeah. laugh injuries. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> We're like twins. <laughs> You're gonna have to pick your brain later. <laughs> awesome. Um, and then I know that some of you have touched on this as well, but we'd love to hear a little bit more about uh, your patient censuses. Are you working with mostly athletes? Are you work like what age range are you working with? And then. Is there a workman's comp component to your practice? You know, I think in a, in a busy day in the office, we'll see 30 to 40 patients usually broken up with a lunch break in between. Um, there's some days where it's flexible. I'll be in the OR in the morning. I'll be in the uh, office in the afternoon. Um, the nice thing about working outpatient surgery center is you can control your schedule a little better. 
once you get to the hospital, you're kind of at the mercy of a lot of other uh, uh, priorities, whether it's other specialties or availability of staff and rooms. So, um, you know, one of the nice things about sports medicine is you could be in an environment where you really can uh, control uh, your your schedule a little better. Um, and and you know, we'll we'll see everywhere. You know, we're not pediatric orthopedic sports medicine doctors, but we'll see people as young as ten to twelve. Uh, up to, you know, the uh, pickleball players in their 70s or 80s. So nice thing about sports medicine, we see uh, all ages. Um, and, you know, there is a, my practice is definitely a work comp component. Work, a lot of work injuries tend to be sports medicine type injuries, ACLs, meniscus, rotator cuff. So, you know, the person jumping off the uh, back of the garbage truck that lands and twists his knee and tears his ACL has kind of the same issues as the um, athlete who does that. But in his case, it's his livelihood and is a lot, sometimes a lot more difficult to get people back to where they were. Um, the nice thing about young athletes is they tend to heal really well. As we get older, we don't heal as well. And, and there's some pre-existing conditions usually present. Uh, so that's a, that's a challenge. Um, I think what else she asked for uh, census. Uh, and, you know, we do see uh, in terms of insurance, we'll see where comp, we'll see commercial insurance, which is more Blue Cross, Aetna, United Healthcare, and then we see Medicare. Um, so we, we see a wide range of uh, of insurance as well. We don't don't see as much uh, motor vehicle and no fault. That tends to be more the spine and back doctors than the sports meds doctors. Yeah, quickly, I, I'd say my population is very similar to Dr. Petrosini. You see kids all the way from you know, middle school, even elementary school, all the way through to, to Medicare age patients, you know, and, uh, you know, the thing about sports medicine is it, it unique in that you do see a lot of people that don't see any other doctors, you know, kids have pediatricians, but, you know, after about 20, most people don't see a doctor again until 40 or 50, uh, you know, unless they get sick, you know, so for the most part, a lot of your patients are, you're the only doctor they see. You're their doctor. It's so funny. Like uh, I have a lot of patients that think I'm in their primary care physician because I'm the only doctor they see. And, uh, you know, we, we do see a lot of healthier, younger patients that don't think they need to see a doctor unless they get hurt playing something. So just, you know, I say that a lot of my patients are even weekend warriors, but, you know, they're still real active. Um, so I, I do see some pediatrics. Pediatrics is pretty hard for us to get. Um, my outpatient that's not associated with Rutgers or my high school, like typically it's 55 years and above. I really get my younger patients through like my concussion clinic, my Rutgers University clinic, um, and my high school. And I know as Dr. Samus was saying, like these kids really, they don't really need to see a doctor often. So I get a, a unique position where I can actually grab the athlete and really do some primary care with them, teach them about their bodies, especially, you know, females. Um, and a lot of conversations you have, especially with like track and some gymnastics um, patients that we have is there's a lot of body image issues. And some of their goals yeah. are actually to not have periods. And now it's counseling like, no, that's not actually good for you. You should be having a period. Um, we're in a very unique situation where Rutgers University has behavioral health. We have nutritionists. Um, we have everything in house, and as primary care physicians, we can actually manage some of the medications that can be used to address anxiety, depression, and you know the underlying root or for some of these, um, you know, mood disorders. And so, I am very lucky to be in a position that I can help a population that doesn't usually go to see a doctor, um, which is one of the the blessings that I have um, in my job, and one of the reasons why I do actually and really enjoy what I do. Okay, are you done? I didn't want yes, to interrupt I you. Do. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, my census is everything. I see work comp, I see motor vehicle, I see the athletes, I see kids. Um, usually seven or eight is the youngest that I'll see with a sports injury with the gymnastics teams or the dancers. Um, and um, what else did they say? They say, oh, how many patients? My pa my patient number is not anywhere near Dr. Petrosini's. I am, I try very hard, but I cannot see people that quickly. I 
but then I do procedures. This is how I, I say to myself, because I have to do an EMG that takes like at least 30 minutes, something that takes 45 minutes. So then that, that takes away a lot of my day. And then some of the procedures that I do, like when I do, um, I, I do PRP with alpha two macroglobulin and it just is so many steps. It takes me, I've never done that faster than an hour and 15 minutes. So that takes a long time. So then it, it winds up being a fewer number of people a day, but, um, um, what was the other question? Is that age census workers comp? Yes. Workers comp is a tough population sometimes because they're a lot of times they're like, they're like angry at whatever happened to them. And so there's a lot of hand holding to try to, they kind of come at you like they, sometimes they don't like trust you because they think that you're working for the insurance company. And truly, I'm really just trying to get them better. So there's that whole other layer that you have to overcome. And then there's this whole other different thing with workers comes that you have to like say what they could do at work. So you have to give them this note. So that's a way to get people mad at you. if you think they can do things at work that they don't think that they can do, so that takes a lot of time to explain that to them. And we write out this like special quick note and um, all of it evolved. Like when, now we have like a giant practice, like we, we have everything. So then it, like that always changes who you're gonna see too. You know, kind of just has changed over the years. I used to see a lot more spine, but they have a lot of currently have a lot of spine surgeons now. So it's sometimes spine surgeons, like as uh, Dr. Stamos was talking about, you don't only just see surgery things. So my practice used to have so much back pain, and now I like mostly see not back pain. But whatever, I I can like I say, I see everything, so I'm happy. I'm happy. I love my job. I love to I love to help all the people. And I I have a patient who's 99 and one that's seven. So it's nice to see all the different ages. And like Dr. Petrosini said, it's really rewarding with the younger ones because they heal so much more quickly and you're like, it's great. You help, you healed them. But a lot of times it's their healing. Yeah. So similar Young to- Young mitochondria. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> similar to Dr. Petrosini, Stamos and Glasser, because uh, we're yeah. in the same practice. I usually yeah. see- um, Patients usually between eight to, I mean, I've had a hundred years old in the clinic, um, different varieties of activity have tennis players in their eighties. Um, you know, typically the physical therapist will see anywhere from 16 to 22 patients a day. 22 is a little bit more manageable. We're seeing two to three initial valves per day. Um, managing those patients in the gym. Uh, those are the type of things we see similar demographics. We see a lot of commercial insurance and a lot of Medicare, um, workman's comp a bit, um, no fault. Like Dr. Petrosini indicated, um, we don't see as much as that. Um, it's definitely on a lower portion of our patients that we're seeing. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's a good variety of patients, especially because we get all different from all of the different fields of orthopedics. So again, we're, we're seeing quite a bit of different patients where, you know, it's, it's funny. Sometimes we're just like, we'll have all total knees in a clinic Sometimes yeah. it's all fine. So it's just interesting. It could flow and it could be completely different in the next hour. So you have to be able to adjust based on what you're coming in and seeing. You know, you have a toddler running around, um, you know, and then you're trying to instruct a patient on how to get back to tennis, you know, and those type of things. So that's pretty much what my day looks like. And then maybe piggybacking off that a little bit. Um, especially because we have so, so many of you from the same practice, it'd be great to hear a little bit about the workflow. I know you've mentioned that even from like total joint specialists through operative sports medicine providers to non-operative to PT and athletic trainers, can you talk a little bit about like what the patient like workflow is in your practice? Yeah, you know, I think um, practice really evolved. There was, there's, there's very few, you know, two or three orthopedists in a practice anymore. It's um, you know, larger practice settings with subspecialists. And um, so even uh, we have physical therapy, we even have urgent care um, on nights and weekends. So literally a patient may get hurt on weekend evening, start by coming into urgent care, seeing a PA, getting an x-ray, crutches, a brace, and then getting an MRI, seeing us in the clinic the next couple of days. And then being sent over to Leon for uh, physical therapy. So it's it's nice when you can um, easily consult with uh, colleagues along that that chain, um, or if I see somebody with a hand injury while I'm seeing for their shoulder, um, I have a hand specialist down the hall who I can 
you know, grab and pull in the room or show an x-ray to, or just make sure they follow up with them. Um, so it's, it, it's, you know, especially with, with physical therapy, uh, as everybody was saying, that even as surgeons, we treat a lot of people non-operatively. And there's probably in the catchment area of our practice, there's probably a, 150 physical therapy clinics from Monmouth, Ocean County and Middlesex. Right. And so it's very hard when you send people out for therapy to get feedback because uh, somebody can send you a report back. But if I had sat down and read every line of every report, I'd never see another patient that day. So um, what, what really I'm, I've been a big proponent of is, is having PT in the house because, you know, I explained to the patients, you, there's good therapists everywhere, but at least with the therapists we have, not only are they clinically, uh, have clinical expertise, but they'll give me a call. I'm, I'm not going to see the patient back for three or four weeks, but they'll call me and so, say, so-and-so is having trouble with with this, just so you so I know, and I don't find out four weeks later, or they'll say they're doing really well. I'd like to move them and advance them a little more. And they'll come up to the clinic and we'll have a conversation. And I think that uh, that workflow is, is, is really helpful because uh, communication in, in medicine in general is, is difficult. Medical records don't speak to each other. Uh, so having the ability to speak to our colleagues and our therapists in the clinic uh, is, uh, is really helpful. Yeah, I would say the thing about sports medicine, you're kind of like the quarterback for a lot of the athletes that you treat. And you may not be the one that's actually doing what's making them better, but you're helping to coordinate their care. And, you know, definitely constantly working with physical therapists because a lot of the things are non-operative and need rehab and recovery. And that could be a physical therapist. It could be the school athletic trainer or the team's athletic trainer. You know, it could be a neuropsychologist for a concussion or, you know, or a non-operative physician for a lot of different conditions. So you're, you're constantly coordinating with other specialists to, to, to help get the athletes back on the field. I, I love having all the specialists in our practice because it's really, it helps the patient get better care because I can just shoot someone a text because we have a concussion specialist. I can talk to a lot of the surgeons that we sometimes Sometimes they do need surgery and I'm not a surgeon. So I, I get almost instant responses. It's amazing. Like I'll be in the room with the patient. I'm like sending the x-ray over to a surgeon. I'm like, hey, do you think this needs surgery? And then I'm like, oh my God, it's fantastic. Like I have a surgical consult for you right now. They, the patients love it. It's, it's really great. We, ha we have a great setup with how many people are in our giant group. You're muted. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, I do think that's something unique to sports medicine. In whatever clinic I am, I do have some access to some kind of physical therapist um, or even orthopedic surgeon that can help me. And I do really enjoy working that team because I continue to learn. Like, you know, I'm still brand new. I'm still finding my way um, as like a newer attending. And I really do rely on my colleagues to help me and, and still like, teach me. And, and I still have mentors that I reach out to. And I think sports medicine in general is a very cohesive um, environments, which is something that was that I quickly picked up on, um, especially when you're doing your rotations, like each specialty has its own personality and you'll very quickly pick up on what the personality is. And I think in general, sports medicine, people tend to be more cohesive, more willing to talk to each other because um, we do seem to have the, the same goal. Um, the way our office works is depending on which office, I either have 15 minutes to 20 minutes per patient, 40 minutes if you're doing a procedure. If it's a newer procedure to our clinic, so Iovera is something that we picked up pretty recently in the past, like maybe three months. And so um, it is something that we have blocked out an hour for because uh, it does take actually quite a bit of time to do an Iovera procedure. Um, again, HPI is important. 90% of the time your diagnosis comes from just HPI exam is more so to verify what you're thinking. And then as a, you know, primary care sports medicine, like I don't do, I don't do operations. So then I have to decide, is this something that I can manage? Or is this something that for the patient's safety, I now need to refer to ortho? Is physical therapy something they can tolerate? Is it not? If I don't think it's, I, it's something they can tolerate because of pain, what can I do to minimize pain? So then when I put them in PT, they can actually progress, they can participate and they can get better and not frustrated with the process because PT does take about six to eight weeks to, you know, really start seeing a good difference, four weeks, you know, for strength to, for the patient to have a little bit more strength. And that's not because the muscle is growing. It's more so because of the motor units um, being more so recruited. And so it is 
amazing when I do have the ability to have a physical therapist with me because they have reached out on occasions and said, hey, listen, this isn't going the way we think it's supposed to be going. We're going to send them back. And these are my concerns. And then sure enough, um, the clinical picture may have changed from when I originally saw the patient. And now I have to go down a different avenue. Yeah, so I think what Dr. Petrosini um, touched on, I mean, this practice is truly amazing. Um, the things from when I were, I was not with this practice, communication, trying to get someone on the phone, um, email, those things, you know, in years past were much more difficult to have the conversations I have with physicians in our practice now. Um, you know, Dr. Petrosini and I have spent a lot of time, he'll text me, he has a patient in the OR, um, you know, gives me the information. We're able to triage, get that patient set up for an appointment within, you know, whatever days they specify. Um, every day I get a list of who's in my facility uh, as I treat out of the main location of Masquan. And I go up and, you know, if there's important relevant information, I try not to waste their time. Uh, they are very busy, uh, but I will, you know, they've always been courteous and it's such a, you know, team um, oriented way of treating a patient where if I just see something wrong with a wound one day, you know, I can send it right to one of our physicians and then the care gets taken care of compared to, you know, getting them in to see the doctor a few days. It's a much quicker route. Um, you know, if I have an ACL patient and the patient, you know, is doing X, Y, and Z, I could just text Dr. Petrosini. What do you think? Gives me the information done instead of having to wait. So that that quicker amount of care, I think, lends to our recovery, um, just being superior in the area. I mean, I always speak highly of uh, our practice, but um, I do feel we have a better edge on that as well. And then I know that we have a few more questions, but I just want to open it up to anyone else if they wanted to chime in, just given that it's 8.45. I can ask a quick question. I think it might, it might sound silly, but I'm going to have one, so uh, bear with me. I feel like there's, you know, an overlap between like sports medicine and just orthopedic specialists in knee and shoulder and so on and so forth. And it, and I'm having trouble understanding like, where does that difference come in? And does it just depend on your decision? What do you want to do more or other factors? Are you talking about, um, in non-operative sports medicine, how do you decide what you're comfortable seeing? Or are you talking about an orthopedic surgery? Uh, Is prob it... probably probably surgery more. I I have to specifically like difference between like a sports surgeon and then like other specialties within orthopedic surgery. You know, I well, I, I will let them answer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I would say there there is a lot of um, overlap between sports medicine and other orthopedists. You know, and I think that as you get into practice, people decide like they're more into doing one part of an athlete's body than another. Like I mainly do shoulder now. I don't do any elbow, but I trained in knee, shoulder and elbow. So a lot of times your practice evolves, you know, maybe because of the environment you're in, maybe it's just what you prefer. You know, uh, sports medicine is the most general specialty of all orthopedists. So the, although you take care of athletes, a lot of times you take care of their whole body, you know, and some specialize in concussions, some specialize in e even soft tissue injuries, uh, you know, muscle pulls. You know, I I was in a another group for a little while where there was somebody that just repaired muscle injuries, you know, which was a very small niche. And you have to be in a huge group to do that. But you know, we do overlap with a lot of general orthopedists and some of them do the same procedures we do. You know, uh, you, you know, it's funny, like the biggest procedure in sports medicine and shoulder has evolved a lot in the last 20 years was the ACL. Like that's people used to joke that that was the only thing that sports medicine doctors or surgeons talked about was the ACL. And yeah, it's a common injury, but there's so many other things that we do. And if I may add in, um, I don't know if this is maybe part of your question, but I'm hoping I'm not kind of pulling back too much. Um, the main difference between what I do and what the orthopedics is that orthopedics, they're they're surgical. They're trained in surgeries. They have OR days. I don't have any of that. So that's why I have all these other modalities that I rely on because I'm 
if I don't think that they're surgical or an orthopedist doesn't think they're surgical, I now have access to non-surgical modalities in order to try to get them through some of the conservative treatments. Because um, at the end of the day, you know, for us in general, um, physical therapy is the treatment for a lot of, of things. So I think be honest with yourself while you're going through things. I, if you asked me when I was a medical student, I wanted to be a surgeon. Like I knew I wanted to be a surgeon. Um, but when I ended up going on my surgery rotations, I realized that I, I have self-diagnosed myself with ADD. <laughs> and so you have me for about 30 minutes. Um, after 30 mi minutes, I lose it. Like I like my mind starts wondering, which is great with a lot of these procedures because you're actually with the person for less than 30 minutes. So like PRP, a lot of the preparation, the patient's not even in the room. It's a centrifuge running for like five minutes at a time. And so I had to be very honest with myself. Like I thought I wanted to be a surgeon, but once I actually went through the rotation, I am not cut out for surgery. And so I rely heavily on people who are surgeons. And so that would be my advice. And that I think is a big difference between what I do and what my orthopedic colleagues do. Just that, I think that's a, a really good question. And it, I think the only, if you really are kind of torn or want to know what that, um, where the difference, difference is and where the dividing line is, is, is try to spend some time rotating in office for a couple of days. And, and I think it'll be a lot clearer if you see the patient's you know, if you spend some time with me and Dr. Stamos and some time with Dr. Glass, so you'd see the, you know, the, the real difference there, because it is hard to explain in a, in a situation like this, but it's a, it's a very good question. Yeah, because it's, it's an overlap too, because um, I know I get referrals from ortho saying, you know, can you help me with this? We don't think it's operative at this point, but then if they fail with me, I send back to ortho and I say, hey, listen, I tried all these modalities. Now I think that they may potentially be an operative case. It, there's a huge overlap. So I do agree um, that, you know, rotating with with those around you to kind of see what really piques your interest. Thank you. I actually have a question. Oh, sorry, okay. Connor. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. I actually have a question that pertains a little bit to the patient workflow topic that we touched upon earlier. So in my head, or at least my experience, because I too am an athlete with, with a history of uh, injuries. And so in my mind, I uh, go through imaging, I see an uh, orthopedic surgeon, I get surgery, then I go to PT. Now this might be related a little bit to Dr. Galante and his experience, but um, I'm curious if you ever see patients who are referred to physical therapy and um, in their event, they actually end up having to be referred to an orthopedic surgeon based on maybe additional findings, um, imaging that might not have been in play, but you suspect an injury that requires surgery. I'm curious if it, if it goes um, back in the workflow a little bit. It, it can very well. I mean, we, those are the conversations we'll have throughout the day. Um, so a lot of times if we don't see something going in that direction correctly, um, you know, it's definitely that conversation back with the orthopedist and say, hey, look, this is what we're seeing day to day. It, it's not fitting into that certain thing. So a lot of times we'll send them back, have that conversation, and then it's taken in a different direction. The other thing is for physical therapy in the state of New Jersey, we have direct access, which means you can see the patient for 30 days or 10 visits. So in that instance, um, I just referred a patient, a PJ golfer, uh, today to Dr. Nick Jarman, uh, because I saw him for two sessions, didn't see the things that I would really see him getting better from physical therapy right now, really felt like he needed some imaging. Um, and, the, you know, obviously the uh, diagnosis from the physician, and it was good. I mean, the person got the right kind of care, loved that we could just get him in that day. Uh, Dr. Jarman was very accommodating. And, you know, the patient's going to come back with me but now he's been given a steroid dose pack and he's going to start a form of treatment where now it's going to help me make that progression with PT, where if I didn't probably do that soon enough, um, you know, it probably wouldn't be seeing the same kind of improvement quicker the way we want it to go. I also feel like I'm very collaborative with certain physical therapists. I mean, Le Leon, I'm not talking about Leon, but let's say there was, I've, I did a research paper um, where I have developed a protocol for injury prevention. And that's one of my passions is injury prevention. 
and someone as skilled as Leon, this isn't a problem, but sometimes they go into therapy. They're just like going, go over there and do that. And they're coming to me and I'm almost doing a physical therapy evaluation, like trying to figure out what functionally, what movement pattern needs to be corrected and then telling the physical therapist that this is their, this is the root cause of the problem. I mean, their workflow can go in all different ways. It's all about communication. That's why I just love having people. That's why this big group is great, but it's just nice to have people who are interested in collaborating because it is not everyone, but I just try to keep with people who are interested in collaborating so I think it's better patient, patient care. I would say one thing too, is a lot of times we'll see uh, patients come from other physical therapy sites. And as Dr. Glasser indicated, they were just doing something not in the right mind for the patient. And again, that's the same thing. Hey, I want to try you for physical therapy. You know, they've been, you know, going around for, they could be there for two months and, you know, not made any care. And at that point, the patient should really be seeing back, going to their, you know, uh, physician, uh, whether it's the primary care, whether it's an orthopedist, whoever's referring us in. Um, so I think, you know, that's clinically where Dr. Glasser spoke. We just have a better ability to see the full picture and know where that person needs to go to. Thank you, everybody. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a question uh, regarding a possible myth uh, with working in sports. Sometimes I've heard uh, it's difficult managing either a coach, parent, or patient's goals when returning to play. Because uh, I remember when I had like a severe ankle sprain about three weeks before a national basketball tournament, and I tried to do everything in my power to return f sooner than I should have because I wanted to play. So I'm just curious to hear how do you all manage uh, those situations? Um, definitely not a myth. Uh, uh definitely a, a large part of, of what we do. And, uh, you know, the athletes, a lot of the athletes we see are uh, very determined to, you know, be the best on their travel team. There's college scholarships involved people, you know, sports medicines, uh, sports in, in, in high school athletes is, and travel athletes has, has changed a lot. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, a lot of management of expectations is probably the best way to put it. And, Sometimes you can't give people an exact answer because you don't know how they're going to heal. Everybody's a little different. Um, and, you know, people go through in the media today, you know, so-and-so is going to be back in, in this amount of time. You know, all the foot and ankle surgeons are very mad at Aaron Rodgers for trying to come back too quickly because now everybody expects to come back that quickly. Um, and Adrian Peterson was ACL years ago. It was the same thing. So, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of um, uh, apprehension. You can see it in parents when their child's injured and not just they want to get better, but are they? How quickly can you get them better? Because they have to make the high school team, or they have they don't want to lose their spot on the travel team, and um, and the and these teams really have become uh, kind of a social situation because you know a bunch of us have kids, uh, minor in college and out of college now, but going through high school and travel sports, it's it becomes their theirs and the parents kind of family a little bit. A lot of stuff, a lot of activity centers around the team, so. There's really this whole um, kind of uh, overriding factor that everybody is is more invested in getting back to the sport. And um, you know, I think when we were playing sports 20 years ago, it was your parents wanted you to get back on the team, but my parents weren't concerned about seeing the other people's parents at tailgating before the game. So um, th th that's a huge part of it. And, and I think you have somebody, we keep talking about communication. The personality of people in sports medicine are collegial. But I think they're also very comfortable talking to families and, and kids. And if you're not someone who uh, enjoys doing that, sports medicine is probably not a great, um, a great specialty. But that's a really good question. I had a, an issue. Oh, sorry. Am I over talking? Okay. okay. I had a just a brief thing. Like, I agree with everything that Dr. Petrosini said. And I was a team physician for a gymnastics team and they wanted me to inject lidocaine, long acting lidocaine into stress fractures so that the kids could compete. And it just became very clear that my personality wasn't gonna work because I would just be too worried that they would 
you know, it, it's not ideal, but a lot of people are doing that to these kids. They're just, oh, you have a fracture. Let me just give you long acting lidocaine and let you go, you know, do these sports. And it's, so it's, it's definitely uh, something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about and how do you kind of meet the, especially in dance, like the, the artistic side versus the medical side. Sometimes they're talking in different languages. It's an art. I'm still learning every day. No, it's it's definitely an everyday occurrence that that conversation you just had, and it's not just the kid; it's the parents, and sometimes it's the divorced parents. Then, you know, there's, right. there's, a lot of, there's a lot of issues to deal with, and you know, I think our job is trying to keep it real, <laughs> and uh, you know, and sometimes you're they're not going to agree with you, and you have to be the bad guy and do what's right for the the athlete, and. Um, and sometimes it's not that clear and it requires seeing them back four or five days later and just regrouping and, you know, giving them the benefit of the doubt, even though, you know, they're not going to be better. It takes seeing them again, just to, to let them know that your interest is to get them back as soon as it's safe. So a lot of times there's, there's a lot of, that's a lot of psychiatry and psychology that goes into it. The one thing I'll say from the rehab standpoint, you know, they'll see the physician we're working with the athlete, you know, three, four days a week. Um, we have the parents involved and they're, they're constantly asking us, so how's he doing? You know, what do you think? Can he get back? And I like to try to stay on the same page with the physician because uh, they'll often like manipulate the situation a little bit. So I'll say, hey, did you say this? Because this is what they're saying. And I'm like, I know it's not what, you know, Dr. Stamos or Dr. Petrosini or Dr. Glasser would say. And just to reiterate, so that when I communicate back to the patient, I'm like, look, now you're still doing X, Y, and Z. You're going to see the physician in two weeks. He'll make a decision on where you are, you know, going forward. Um, so I think just being on the same page, um, we might have slightly, you know, I might try to emphasize he's doing a certain amount of, you know, in rehab. And I think he's ahead. Um, but again, we're really trying to keep that same page. No, no confusion. The patients, you know, are not trying to, um, and the the parents aren't trying to, you know, use one against the other because they're getting the same message. Yeah, I, you know, at the end of the day, our priority is the athlete, the health health of the athlete, getting them back on the field, and you are their advocate, especially when they're when they're when they're in high school, you know, pediatric age. You are their advocate. And so you have to make some hard decisions and sometimes you have to become pretty assertive because, yeah, you're going to be pulled in many different directions. But at the end of the day, you look at that kid and you're like, what would I do if this was my kid? What would I do if I, I was in that position? Because, you know, we were, we were all athletes growing up. So I sometimes think back like, yeah, when I was a gymnast, maybe this is what I would have wanted, but I would hope that my physician would steer me in the right direction. And yet you're going to be, have to become assertive. Um, I had a really big issue with one of my high school students. He's type one diabetic, was on the football team. His blood sugars were dropping to the forties while he was in practice. And his dad and him were very reluctant to the idea that, yeah, you know what? You have type one diabetes, you need to eat before you practice. And he really didn't want to. So one day he turned off his Dexcom so we couldn't see what his blood sugars was. And the day that happened, it happened to be when I was actually there. And so I was notified. And so I made a really tough decision because we had been dealing with this for quite a while. And so I actually told him he was, I had the athletic trainer pull him from practice. And I told the family that he's not allowed to practice until we have a family meeting um, because it's really dangerous for him to be in a contact sport and have blood sugars of 40. And so that was something that I had to do. I didn't want to do it, but, um, you know, for his safety, it was something that ended up happening. And, you know, every day you're going to have difficult conversations, even today, especially with concussions, because I am part of a concussion clinic. I have a swimmer who unfortunately is supposed to go to States this weekend, but I just saw her today for the first time for a concussion and she's extremely symptomatic. So, you know, telling her that all her hard work, as happy as I am that she made States, she's really not going to be able to do what she wanted to do um, because of how, you know, symptomatic she is. I would say that's the worst part of the job. That's mm -hmm. just, it's hard. Yeah, I think it's somewhat unique. Mm -hmm. So, you know, no one goes to the uh, general surgeon has a colostectomy and an appendectomy and says, you know, I need to, I'll be back on the field in six weeks. And, um, 
you know, sports medicine, maybe it's because of the media, maybe because I was an athlete and, you know, coach, everybody thinks there's, a, there's an, they're, they're an expert. So your patients are hearing a lot of different people telling them their experience. And, you know, my friend got back at this time or a coach will say, yeah, you should be back in eight weeks. And like I said, you don't see that with general surgery or ENT or neurosurgery, but in orthopedic sports medicine, you'll see that. So you really end up managing a lot of, uh, hearsay that the patients are hearing and, you know, they don't know better. They come in and they start asking questions based on that. So that's something kind of unique. That's a little bit of a negative in, in orthopedics and sports medicine in particular is there's a lot of, a lot of experts out there and uh, the kids and the, even the adults are hearing this. So. Awesome. Uh, I just want to be mindful because I know everyone has busy schedule on the call now. I uh, just want to make one more plug. We posted a uh, survey for feedback for any of the students that were on the call. And then thank you to all of our panelists. I know this was a great opportunity to experience what a career in sports medicine would look like from an operative side, a non-operative side, and then also from a physical therapist standpoint. Um, we really appreciate you all taking time out of your day to speak with us. Thank you, Connor. Yeah, it was a pleasure, Connor. Thank yep. you, everybody. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Have a good night.